a, a great morning already as we worship the Lord together. And if you happen to have a chance to be with us over the last 24 hours, um, we, we began on Saturday at 7 with a time of worship, just honoring God together corporately. And then from there, just carried that time into prayer until um, 6 o'clock on Saturday, where we worshiped again for an hour. It's like bookends of worship and then a lot of prayer. And there's something special that happens when God's people get together and pray. It, it really does change things. It changes the atmosphere, meaning the atmosphere of our hearts. But I don't, I don't mean like to be all woo, but I mean just when even when you walk in for me today, it's like, whoa, it's just the, the, the lingering presence of God is here. And so I want to thank everybody who came out to pray and, and also just speak into you all that this is who we are. This place is a house of prayer. It's a sanctuary. It's devoted to one thing. Um, that's the worship of God, to draw near to God, to experience his presence. That's what we do in here. It's not a, an auditorium. Um, it's, it's a sanctuary, and we want to keep it that way, where this is where we come to pray. This is where we come to meet with him. This is where we come to fellowship together, and, and uh, what a privilege that we have to, to have it, right? Yeah, so cool. Um, the other thing that, that I wanted to, to mention is on Tuesday um, of this coming week, it marks the 35th anniversary of this church. It's 35 years. And uh, it just so happens that there are three ladies sitting together that were key along with their husbands in seeing this place come about. So Millie, Ruthann, and Phyllis, will you stand and just let us honor you for everything that you've invested in. It's, it's difficult to even understand what, um, what it takes to, to start a church. I never had to do that. I got to stand on the shoulder of giants. See, I, I was really privileged that I got to pastor a church that had already been established, but you guys did the work. Um, you prayed. You sought God. You experienced His presence. You, you got together with other leaders, and, and you formed a church that wasn't your idea. It wasn't Noel's idea. It wasn't John's idea, but it was God's idea, and you all were obedient to it. And so uh, I just— I, I'm, I just want to honor you, and I want to thank you for letting us stand on your shoulders and, and, uh, and continue on with what God has in the future. So we do. We honor, we honor you guys. So yeah, good stuff. So on Tuesday, um, that's 35 years, and you can, you can think about that. Um, I don't know why I just said think about that on Tuesday. It's kind of like a transition into the next thing, I guess. But, uh, but it, is, it is significant. Um, this morning, I, I, I want to spend time in the book of Exodus. I left you on a little bit of a cliffhanger because um, I was so excited, and I am so excited about the things that I'm learning about the character and nature of God. Um, God is always, always going to surprise us with his goodness. He's always going to give us an opportunity to know him more until we're with him in eternity to where we'll know him perfectly and be known perfectly. But how cool is it that the faith that you have, the relationship that you have with God, if you choose to, if you choose to dive into him, if you choose to know him more, you can know him more for the rest of your life. That you never have to stagnate. You never have to get to that point where it's like, yep, got it, know it, I'm just going to move on. But for the rest of your lives, you can know more of God. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. And the more that you get to know him, the more that your life is transformed by him. That there's lots that you can do to try to self-help. There's things that you can do to, um, yeah, to create new habits. And isn't the New Year's all about that? And, <laughs> and some of us have already made uh, New Year's resolutions that have already been broken, right? And you're just like, oh, thanks a lot, man. But, but that's kind of, I mean, New Year's resolutions are great. And, and having the beginning of a new year where that marks a time where you can start new habits, it's all great. But, but it isn't uh, tr as transformational as putting your hands in, in just sweet surrender to God and knowing Him more and allow Him to change you from the inside out. When God changes you from the inside out, your behaviors change, right? He's the one that transforms you and you act differently. But it doesn't always work the other way around where you just sort of act differently and then your insides change. Does that make sense? So in other words, you can behave all day long but still be like wretched inside. And that's called hypocrisy. That's just sort of faking it along. But, but allowing God to change you from the inside out is, is what the Christian faith is all about. It's what knowing Jesus is all about. It's what following him is all about. And so you're on a, you're on a good road. Um, you're on, on what is, is, uh, is not always an easy road. How many of you would raise your hand and go, yep, not an easy road. Come on, tell the truth. Not an easy road. But it is, is anything in life that's easy, that just comes easy, is it worth it? Not, not really. 
Not really. So many spend time um, just trying to find the easy way to money, the easy way to popularity or whatever else, and it never ends well. You just watch those MTV documentaries. They'll tell you that all day long about every rockumentary, about every band who is just amazing, right? And, and their life that, that takes the exact same plot and the same turn into self-destruction and whatever else. But knowing God leads to a, just a continual, um, yeah, just... A life abundant as he promises. And, and when we talked last week, I gave you probably for too long just some of my thoughts about the coming year. And I just want to reiterate a few things. And because one, um, one thing that, that continues to stick with me, and we sang it in a song today too, and I loved it, is about a new horizon. And you might remember the analogy of a tide. Like the tide goes way out, doesn't it? But the, when the tide goes way out, what does it do when it's done going way out? It comes back, right? And, and, and my belief is that our tide as a society, our tide as a culture, even within Christian culture, but popular culture for sure, has gone so far out. Like the tide has gone so strangely, oddly, bizarrely far out that the average person is like, whoa, this is weird. They just don't say it because everybody else around them, it just agrees with the weirdness, right? And you don't want to like stand out as one who's calling something weird that's weird. But, but the tide has gone so far out. Am I right or am I the crazy? crazy one. And, and so as it goes so far out, that to me is hope because it, how, how much further out can it go? And, and, and I believe that that tide is turning and what, what turns and what comes back in is, is, is some, something of an opportunity for us as the body of Christ to, to see God's goodness just rush over a culture and a society again and to identify what God is up to and, and be a part of what God is up to, to be a part of his plan. And, and that's what I want for my life. And so I'd keep your eyes open in 2019 for ways to, to be about the kingdom of God right? The kingdom of God is about restoration. It's about making all things new. So whatever is broken needs to get fixed, and it's your job to fix it. <laughs> I don't know what you came to church for today, but that's truth. Amen. That's truth. That's, that's, that's a different kind of truth than maybe what we're used to, because one truth that we're used to is just, you know, hang out, stay comfortable, listen to some sweet music, hopefully laugh a little bit in the sermon, you know, and, and keep your life somewhat moral, and you'll be good to go and get to heaven. But, but that's not the story Jesus told at all. Um, the story that, that Jesus told was about a broken world, and he gave us the opportunity to bring in the kingdom of God, to usher in the kingdom that he inaugurated with his life here on this earth. And so um, what I called you to, and what I believe that God's called us to in, in the coming year, is a year where we'll begin to see with kingdom vision, right? We'll see with kingdom vision. How many of you want kingdom vision, right? Yeah. Kingdom vision allows you to see what others can't see, to see it in other people, to see it in situations, to see not only potential, about what God has in mind. And maybe, just maybe, your involvement in a situation can change the destiny of a person's life. That's huge. Yeah, it's a heavy, yeah, it's a responsibility, but what a privilege it is to, to be able to be a part of something that rewrites the trajectory of someone's life. Someone did it for you. Someone did it for you. Yes, Jesus did it. Yes, Jesus transformed your life. He gets all the credit, all the glory, and all the honor. But, but how many of you would say that you just sat alone in a room and Jesus appeared to you and spoke to you and told you what to do and then you did it? Some people have that story, but very few. Jesus used people who got involved in your life and loved you enough to, to see something in you that you couldn't see in yourself and then encourage you with truth and with God's word to, to point you in a direction that literally changed the trajectory of your life. You would not be the same person that you are today, nor would your families be the same families that they are today, nor would your workplaces be the same workplaces that they are today had somebody not gotten involved with kingdom vision and seen what nobody else could see. And so I call you to that in this coming year, but not only to kingdom vision, but kingdom action. Two totally different things, right? Kingdom vision, you can write blogs about that. You can post all day long about kingdom vision and, and do it. But kingdom action is the step where you put one foot in front of the other and you begin to get involved. And I'm preaching to myself because it's messy when you do this stuff, right? It's like, whoa, I got lots going on in my life. I got things happening. I don't know that I have time for kingdom vision and kingdom action. But this is what we're called to do. And this is the good life. This is the life that Jesus has for us. And so before I, I get way too high on my soapbox, um, 
I, I, I want to bring us back to Exodus chapter 3 because the way that, that, that we get involved in kingdom vision and kingdom action is getting close to the king. And when you get close to the king, you can't help but be a part of his heart. You can't help but see the way that he sees. And you can't help but love the way that he loves. And you're not going to be perfect in it, not this side of eternity. But you're, you're going to continually get better and better and better at it the more that you develop a life of worship that's devoted to the king. And worship isn't just the songs that we sing, right? You know that by now, don't you? Worship just isn't how loud you sing or how high you raise your hands or if you kneel really good or if you get crazy and dance a little bit or if you hoot, holler, scream or if you lay down flat before the Lord. All those things are biblical and great. But worship is literally when you offer your life. Like this life that I have, God, I offer to you as a living what? Yeah, a living sacrifice. It belongs to you. So God, do with it what you will. And church is great. The, these gatherings that we have are great to, to get us back to true north, to remind us what we're all about and what we're doing in this life. Because if we didn't have this, wouldn't we wonder? The old hymn that says, I'm prone to wonder, right? I'm prone to wonder. I am prone to wonder. My mind can't keep a, a, a thought for more than 15 seconds, right? I'm prone to wonder. You're prone to wonder. Maybe you're already wondering now, like wandering into a different place. Like, where's he going with this message? I don't know. <laughs> But, but what, what's good about this, we focus in on the king, we focus in on who God is, and we learn more of his character together, and that's the, the goal of, of this morning's message. And so Exodus chapter 3 um, is where I, I left us off last week, and I want to put back up a quote that I, I read from A.W. Tozer, and I, as I said before, anytime A.W. Tozer says something, you should listen, um, uh, and it always hurts a little bit. And... <laughs> And, and this is what he says. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I'm going to stop there just for a second. That we all have a concept of God, an idea of God. Um, and it comes from various different things. It comes from our upbringing. It can come from our family of origin. It can come from our experiences. It can come from our hopes, what we want God to be like, right? That what we, what we dream God would be for us. But we all have a preconceived idea about who God is. Some people have an idea about God that he's really angry. They don't want to get anywhere near him. Um, I've said this a bazillion times. People say, I don't really want to come to church because my life is miserable enough. And if I come in there, God's going to get mad at me and strike me down, right? That we feel like that this is maybe who God is. Um, other people have a super benevolent view of God. Like God is just like Santa Claus. Um, he's awesome. He's old and, and gray-haired and super jolly. And as long as you're not naughty but nice, God gives you stuff, right? And if you behave really, really well, and by the way, he's always watching. And, and if you behave really, really well, he's going to give you presents. Right? And it's good presence, right? And so you're like, what are you talking about? It's true. Some of us have this, these two different spectrum ideas of who God is, but neither one are exactly what the Bible teaches. Um, it says, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. So whoever you've created God to be in your mind, whatever your preconceived idea about him is, you're moving towards that. You're, you're moving towards that in terms of your soul. This is who you think God is. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. What we think about God drives our behaviors. What we think about God drives our culture. It makes us who we are. Would we all agree on that thought? <laughs> Apparently not. So... <laughs> So it's important that we're always like fine-tuning and sharpening our image of who God is. That we're always going back to the truth of God's word and re-honing, you know, keeping something sharp. You know, a knife is a dangerous thing, isn't it? But, but what's more dangerous, a dull knife or a sharp knife? A dull knife, right? And so, so our views and our concepts of God can be a very dangerous thing. We need to sharpen them so that it becomes something of a useful tool in our lives and for other people. And so, um, so when we look at the life of Moses, I think Moses' life just tells us so much about God. Because for, for one thing, and where I left you, um, and where I hope to get back to today, is God encounters Moses in the most special way of any human up until that point in time. There were other humans that, that God had a special relationship with. 
with, but there was something unique about Moses' relationship with God. Adam had a super awesome relationship with God. Don't we all just wish we had like the first 15 minutes of Adam's life, right? Or however long it took for him to blow up big time, where, where, where he walked with God and there was perfect union with him. And that was special. And Abraham had a really special relationship with God. God talked to him and made it super clear that you're to leave the metropolitan area that you're in. Like you're to leave the, all the comforts of, of Ur where you are and you're supposed to just go into the desert and live in tents and I'm with you. And Abraham trusted God enough to do it. That was a special relationship. Moses had something different than both of them, right? And so when we break back into the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 3, um, we, we find Moses in, in, in right around um, his, his 80s. He's not a young dude. His life up until that point was really interesting, right? You know the story of Moses, right? And if you don't, I'm going to tell you right now because um, if you don't, you're, you feel obligated to shake your head yes, but you're like, wait, maybe I do. Do I know the story of Moses? So I'm going to give you a little background. Moses um, grew up in a time, or he was born into a time of, of just uh, turmoil in his particular people group. The people of, of, of Israel, the Hebrew people, were living in the, the nation of Egypt, right? And what started out as good in the nation of Egypt, where God used Joseph to, to, to really save and restore his people and protect them, it turned into something that wasn't so good. After many, many years, the king that knew Joseph and, and honored the people of Israel had died. And so now, these Hebrew people just couldn't stop multiplying, man. They were coming, they were everywhere. There's like, are you Hebrew? Are you Hebrew? There's Hebrews everywhere, right? And so the people of Egypt were getting nervous because there were too many Hebrews in their pure Egyptian land. And so they looked around and the king that rose up or the Pharaoh said, we got to do something about this. So we need to start wiping out all these, all these Hebrews. And so he goes to the, to the midwives that were Hebrew midwives. They were the ones that obviously were helping to deliver the babies. And he says, when a, when a baby boy comes, just kill him. And the Hebrew midwives were like, What? And so when, when they were put in the position to do what they were ordered to do by the king, they didn't do it. And because they didn't do it, God honored and favored them. And when the king found out that there were still more babies coming, like they were just continuing to grow, this nation was blessed. It was kind of like it was multiplying, so much so that there was like the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. It was a lot of people. And as they did, and they came back, the, the Pharaoh came back to these midwives and says, what are you doing? They said, we can't help it. These Hebrew women, man, they just, they just have these babies too quick. And by the time we get there, they're, the babies are already there, and we've, they've already moved on. And so um, it gets a little bit more serious, and there's a little more enforcement on trying to regulate the population of these Hebrew people. There's a special boy that's born. You know the story of Moses, this special boy. And they're able to see something special about them early on. And I think that when we all have our kids, we think there is something special about our kids, right? There is just something that no other kid has. Pastor Andy's experiencing that right now. How cool is that to just see for he and Natalie? You know, we, we were able to, to visit with them yesterday. And uh, just so like intuitive and just natural parents. It was just really beautiful to see what God's doing in their lives. But, but I'm certain they think their baby's special. I'm certain you think your baby Grace is special. And she is. Anyone who has a baby. When we had our daughter Kate, we thought, man, she's the most brilliant child in the universe, and she really is. And when we, and we, and we had our son Daniel, we're like, man, he's the strongest, most creative guy in the world, and he is. But we see something special in our kids because we see within them the image of God. And that was seen within Moses, the image of God, but like almost in this special way where other people could see it too. And so this particular baby, he, he, was, he was rescued. He was rescued. He was put into this basket. In this basket, he was sent down the Nile River. And, and as the story goes, Pharaoh's daughters are out there doing what they do. And they see this, this baby come by and they're like, that baby's special. I want to make that baby my own. That's one of those Hebrew babies. And had compassion. Like my dad's crazy for killing all these babies. How could you kill a precious little baby? So they, they, they take this baby and they, and, and she raises her as, as her own, as, as his, her, well, you know what I'm trying to say. And, 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 and gets even a, a Hebrew um, lady to come in and nurse the baby. And guess God in his providence brings Moses' real mother to do that job. Awesome story. Read about it. It's, it goes really quick. First few chapters of Exodus. Now for the next 40 years, Moses is raised in this um, Pharaoh's household. He's the little prince, right? You got to believe this guy had privileges like crazy. And so um, for, for 40 years, uh, what, what, what theologians would say is his life was inflated, right? 
Some of us understand what that's like. Everything just goes well. It's just the wonder, the glory times. Like everything's really, really great. And, and um, he comes to a point where he sees his own people being oppressed, right? The Egyptian people were just, uh, excuse me, the Hebrew people were, were being oppressed in the way that they were treated. They were caused to make brick without um, any of the straw. It was like impossible job. Just work them to death. That was the strategy. And, and they continue to work hard with physical labor. One day Moses sees uh, the, the Egyptian um, be harsh with one of his own people. And you know this story, right? What he does is he's like, uh-uh. He looks to the right. He looks to the left. He looks up. He looks down. And -pah 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 -wah! He kills him. He kills that Egyptian. And then, and then he drags the body away and <laughs> buries in the sand like super fast. And he's like, yes, nobody knows. Goes on with his uh, Hebrew slash Egyptian life. Then shortly after, he sees two of his own brothers, right? Two other, Hebrew pe two other Hebrew men fighting. And he's like, whoa, bros, why are you guys fighting? We're all together. He goes, oh, what? You're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Interesting how things that are done in secret come to the light. We think all this stuff's secret. You ain't hiding anything. Nobody's hiding anything, right? We just think that we're hiding stuff. And so, so now the story's out, and, and, and they have to, um, you know, Moses has to deal with this, this revelation, and he, he understands that Pharaoh also knows about it, and that now he's a murderer, and he has to flee, and he flees to the land of Midian. That's where we find him in the story. And in the land of Midian, uh, Midian was not like— uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it was not like for an Egyptian raised in a royal household. It, I, I'm going to say this and hopefully I don't offend anyone, but it would be like, you know, you grow up in Newport Beach, right? And Newport Beach is this great place and it's privilege and whatever else. And we're like, hey, we're going to send you out to Barstow, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. If that, and I think Barstow is beautiful, but, but most people don't, right? And so, so... And when you go out to Barstow, you're going to be a, you be one of those guys that like sweeps dirt all day long. That's just what you do. So basically, I don't even want to go there, but pick whatever you job, whatever job you think is the lowest of the low. And, and so for now, this Egyptian who had been so elevated, it's like, I'm awesome. Now he finds himself running to a far distant land where he can hide out and he becomes a shepherd, which is like the lamest job that anyone could ever have in the eyes of an Egyptian. It's like a really, really shameful kind of job. But he gets pretty good at it, apparently. Uh, there's something in him that's a protector. He, he makes him score some points right on early on when he gets to Midian. Um, the, the, for, um, there's a guy's uh, daughters that are there getting water and some other shepherds come and they chase him away. And Moses is like, uh-uh. He protects these women and gets a wife out of the whole deal, right? So it's awesome. So now he's married there. His dad is a priest and now he tends the flock. So are you now together with the story of Moses? So there he is. And where we left off last week, he's out doing what shepherds do ordinary mundane shepherd stuff. It wasn't like glorified shepherd stuff. It wasn't like the picture that you see with a guy with a super clean thing and like a staff and just the sheep are just so pleasantly laying, you know, in the green, in the green pasture. And it's like, oh no, no sheep, you know. It was like a, it was the worst job. It was 24-7. You watch sheep for a living. It's all you do. There was nothing great about it. And he's 40 years into it. Like his career, he's like ready for retirement. He's like, I've done this long enough. Mundane, every day, day after day. When you read it in the Bible, it's one little paragraph. When you look at it from a blown up perspective, it's 40 years of his life. Day after day after day after day. Showing up to just look after sheep. How long have you been waiting for that breakthrough moment? Like how long have you been waiting for God to show up in your life, right? And so Moses just one day, just one day when it all adds up, a bush catches on fire that doesn't burn. And when it catches on fire and it doesn't burn, Moses is like, oh, isn't that interesting? And the Bible's so good to record this for us because it helps us to see the human element and how God connects and relates with people right? That it, this is not just some scripted thing between you and God. This is a dynamic, real relationship where he waits to see how you're going to respond to something that he throws at you. And then he responds in kind. And so he throws this thing at Moses, a bush that doesn't catch on fire. He throws the, he, Moses looks at it, and then the scripture it says, Moses basically, I'm, I'm going to read it to you so I don't mess it up. He says, um, 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames. This is Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. Uh, and the fire beneath the bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. But Moses thought, I will go over to see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. He thought in his mind, I'm, I'm going to go check that out. And the Bible records it. And God is watching. God sees. God's concerned about Moses. He's concerned about his people. We know that because the scripture gives us that context. And so he, he, he waits to see what Moses does. Moses goes and God's like, okay, sweet. Now we're going to talk. And this conversation that Moses has with God is epic. It is life-changing for him. It's life-changing for his people. And it's life-changing for you if you want it to be. And here's what he says. Um, he, he goes over and, he, and the Lord saw that he went over and took a look. And this is in chapter 4. And then God calls him from within the bush. Excuse me, this is verse 4 of chapter 3. And God calls him uh, from within the bush and says what? Moses, Moses. It's kind of where we dropped off last week. It was the double Moses. Man, whenever God does the double name, it's a big deal. Moses, Moses. There are like eight or nine times in scripture where God does the double name thing, right? And they're all moments that, that indicate intimacy. It's like, I know you. I've got something to say. Listen to me. Anytime that you repeat yourself several times, you really want someone to understand what you're saying, right? I, I had a conversation with somebody and, and I, I, I repeated myself like three times and they identified it. They're like, yep, got it. Three times, three different ways. I understand what you're trying to say. I was grateful for that, but it kind of told me, hey, you're going in a loop here. But God, when he wants to get someone's attention, Moses, Moses. You remember little baby Samuel? Samuel, Samuel. I've got something I want to say to you, but it didn't stop there. Abraham, Abraham. When God spoke double Abraham, it was right at the moment where he was testing him, where Isaac's on the altar. And, and he, he was ready to sacrifice his own son. And God's like, Abraham, Abraham. How many of you know if you've got a knife like this and you're ready to, to do what you think God is telling you to do, but it's this humongous test. You want to hear your name crystal clear two times, right? <laughs> Abraham, Abraham. And God shows him, I've provided something else, a ram in the thicket. Um, Jacob, Jacob, right? He tells Jacob two times, Jacob, Jacob. And that was when it was, Jacob, it's okay for you to go to Egypt to reunite with, with your family. I've got, I'm doing something. Oh, how about this one? Martha, Martha. Jesus says, Martha, Martha. And, and I'm just going to read this. I know you. He says, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. That might just be the only takeaway that you have from today's message. But if you do, maybe God wants to speak to you as he spoke to me through that. Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things. You're bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. And obviously he was, he was referring to Mary and how she wanted to spend time at Jesus' feet, but that's not the message. Um, Saul, Saul. You remember Paul, who was Saul? Saul, Saul on the road to Damascus. Gets blinded. God says, Saul, Saul, I'm getting your attention. And guess what he says to him? Why are you persecuting me? Stop hurting my people. When you hurt my people, you hurt me. There was something really important I need to say to you. Peter, right, whose name was also Simon. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I pray, I intercede for you. And we know that what he was referring to was, was that, that moment in time where, where he was going to deny Christ. But how about this one? Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you get the desperate? Like there are moments. There are certain times that are moments. It's not like, hey, what's up, Toby? Like it's Toby, Toby, right? It's my God, my God. This is crazy. Why have you forsaken me? I love this one. Over an entire people, over an entire city, Jesus stands out and goes, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to, to gather you in and comfort you. Like, like the imagery is I want to put my wings around you but you won't let me. Desperate moment. And so we get to this point, Moses, Moses. God's got Moses' attention and hopefully he's getting yours and getting mine. And Moses says what Samuel says and Moses puts himself in a posture of, okay, I'm going to listen. And this is the posture. Moses says these words, here I am, right? Now, when God throws burning bushes in your mundane everyday life, don't ignore them. Go look. Check out what's going on. When God's calling your name, respond, here I am. You're saying, okay, well, does he do that in an audible voice? Probably not. 
Maybe. But when you know, when you're drawn towards the presence of God, go closer to it. Don't run away from it. Don't let flight take place. Do what Moses did. Run towards it. Run towards God. And so as he runs towards God, um, God says this, which might sound a little confusing. Don't come any closer. It's like, wait, 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 what's going on here? You're calling me, you double Moses to me. <laughs> How is it that I can't come any closer? God said, take off your sandals for the place that you're standing is holy ground. There's a lot in this. The taking off of the sandals was symbolic and also literal. And, and I could be wrong about some of this, but I, my, my imagination just went a little bit wild, so I'm going to have you go there with me. But first for the, the, easy, the easy one. It was common in Egyptian culture as well as Hebrew culture for the priest to take off his shoes when he was in the presence of God or when the presence of whatever deity that the particular priest in Egypt was worshiping. It was a sign of respect. In fact, today, if you were still to go to Egypt or if you were to go to the Middle East, you would find that the removal of shoes in holy places is a sign of respect, honor, and humility. And that is a, that is a, that's, you could take that all the way to the bank. That when God calls you and he wants to draw you close, it's like, shoes off, God, I'm humble before you. I'm humble before you. I respect you, God. I honor you. And maybe ways that you've heard this before, and it's probably true, is that you don't get too close to the presence of God because God's presence is dangerous. Holiness, when it comes into the, into, um, impurity, the Bible uses imagery like fire consuming stuff, right? So you don't want to be consumed by the presence of God, and there could be some of that. But I don't think God was simply saying, don't get any closer. I actually think that God was saying, come closer, but you got to do some things first. Okay, so God, this was a totally invitational conversation. This wasn't like, God doesn't play games. We, we create this thing that God's like the divine game player. He's not. That's us trying to interpret what he's doing. But God is saying, Moses, Moses, come near. And it's like, whoa, not yet, buddy. Don't come so close. Take off your shoes. Humble yourself. Respect me. Honor me. See, have a proper image of who I am, not the one that you've created in your mind, because I'm about to show you who I am. I'm about to tell you who I am. That's the literal one. The figurative one um, is, don't we get a lot of junk in our shoes? Okay, now put yourself in, in ancient times. You are uh, you're a shepherd and you're in a dusty field in Midian. What's in your shoes? Stuff, man. I actually, thanks to the internet, I did like way too much research on ancient Egyptian footwear. And literally people, I found somebody who had a PhD in ancient Egyptian footwear and published a paper on it, right? I'm not kidding you. That is a lot of time spent on... Pharaoh shoes. But, but the benefit of it is, is they've done research and there's archaeology that shows what their shoes actually look like. And so for your benefit today, I'm going to put these shoes up on the screen. Wow. Okay. I think those look like hipster socks, right? Like somebody who's like, dude, I wove them together and I hand did them. These are like the socks. I, they're artisan socks. Uh, these are the, the, the Egyptian socks, right? And don't kid yourself, like the pictures that we have of, of, of shoes in those ancient times, Midian was a cold place. He's up on Mount Horeb. It's, it's high altitude. Chances are he not only had shoes, but he had socks on. It's a known fact that socks were part of the deal in ancient Egypt, okay? Um, and the shoes, we, all, all, we always think they're like the super sweet sandals, you know, that like go all the way up. And, and uh, the shoes are probably something more like this, right? I had another really cool picture of, of actual ones that they found that they had gone through and taken them apart to show how they were constructed. It's fantastic. It's just amazing stuff. But, but the point is, in our mind, we think of like those Roman sandals, don't we? At least I do. They just lace all the way up. But different people wore different shoes for different jobs. And a shepherd would probably have worn some of these sweet loafers right here. <laughs> and and so, um, so in those shoes, actually, if you could put them back up real quick again. If you would imagine those super rad socks and then those shoes, and then God says, uh, take off your shoes and, and, and the place that you're standing is holy, there's going to be something that happens. And you might let your imagination go as mine did. When you've hiked, when you've worked in your yard, when you've gotten your feet nice and sweaty, and uh, whatever it is, what happens when you take off your shoe first? You're like, oh, right? 
Okay, how much better is it when you take off your socks and your feet start to breathe? You're just like, oh. And, and out of those shoes come the burrs and the, the pebbles and the dirt. And your feet look nasty, but they feel great. Right? They all white and they're all white and like milky because of the sock and everything. But, but you're just like airing them out, trying to, trying to get them to come alive again. But they feel good. But in that moment, you're, you're not like, okay, I want to go visit the neighbor right now. You, you just kind of want to be alone with your vulnerable foot. Feels great, but it feels really vulnerable. I just want to say that I think that's what it's like when we come into the presence of God with all the stuff that we bring into his presence. We can choose to do it really dignified and keep our shoes on, keep all the burrs in there and start to feel a little better because we don't want anyone to see it or we don't want to be vulnerable. But when God calls us to that place of humility and respect, he calls us to take all that off. And when we take it all off, it's really scary. It's really scary what our feet look like. It's really scary what our feet feel like. You don't want to go walking through, you know, barefoot with your, your milky feet like that. You're like, what does that even mean? Let me try to say. What do feet do? What do your shoes do? Where have your shoes been? Right? Your shoes are bringing something into a situation and they're bringing something out of a situation. Um, one of the things that Moses had in his feet were all the stuff that I said in a very literal way, but in a very figurative way, he had a lot going on in his past. I gave you a snapshot of it. But he had the label of murderer, of privileged Newport Beach kid. He had all that stuff on him in his past. He had experiences, good and bad. He had failures, successes, hurts, and disappointments. Our identities are shaped oftentimes by our past. Wouldn't you agree? And our past can be symbolic of our shoes and what we bring into God's presence. What are we walking in with, you know? What are we walking in with? The other thing, well, the thing about our past too, and I think it's important to say, sometimes in church settings when we talk about our past, we talk about... Um, our, all the terrible crazy stuff that we did and if you only knew how bad I was and all the drugs I did or the alcohol I did or you know whatever gang I was involved in all that and, and, and that's praise God that he delivered you from all of that but in another setting for those that may not relate with that story you also have a past and sometimes your past might include crazy great success with God like the good old days and, and that can be equally as dangerous. You're like, how? How could that be equally as dangerous? Because when you're trying to understand what God is doing and what God is saying, and you're trying to hang on to your past, whether it be um, the negative parts about your past or the positive parts about your fast, past. In other words, reliving the glory days in any way, shape, or form. You can honor those days. Praise God. And I'm not saying anything disrespectful about those days. I've had some wonderful days in my life. But I can't recreate them. I can't, bring the, I can't bring those shoes into a fresh encounter with God. God's calling me to take those off and all those things, just stand there vulnerable before him and say, what do you want to say to me? The other thing that we bring in, our shoes bring in mess. Um, sheep poop. <laughs> it's true enough. And when, when you step in that, in, in your Egyptian footwear, it gets everywhere. You're, you're bringing that mess right in. Some of you are shaking your head going, are you allowed to say poop from the pulpit? I, I don't know. I just did. So, they, they, he stepped in a lot of stuff. You, you may have stepped in a lot of messes, messes that you've created, other people have created. It's not just the choices you've made, but the choices of people around you. And you get in that, that environment where there's just a lot of mess. It's on your feet. And it becomes evident and you walk in with it and, 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 and how great that God's like, whoa, it's not don't come near me. It's you're welcome to come near me, but let's get that stuff off first, right? Let's, let's take your shoes off and stand before me where I can speak to you in an identity and create an identity that's true of who you are. Our messes can include moral choices, secret sins. God's, God's presence exposes our need for confession, repentance, and forgiveness, right? And I can't tell you how many times I feel like I've said this, but, but confession, repentance, and forgiveness is not like, oh no. It's like, oh yes. Confession, to be able to get free of the secrets that we hold. You don't have to do it in front of a whole room of people. But my goodness, to be able to do it in front of somebody that you trust. To be free of something that you've held on to for so long. To take those shoes off and the socks with it. 
but not only to confess it, to, to say to God, I don't want to walk that way anymore. I want to walk the opposite way. And by your grace, I'm going to do it. And then to go, wait, you forgive me just like that? Scott and I were having this conversation about the book, Practicing God's Presence. And, and there's a, a part in that, in that book where um, Scott was relaying back to me how, how oftentimes we, we, over, um, just we overstress all the complexity of forgiveness where we can come to Jesus and just say, socks off, this is who I was, this is my mess, I did it, I blew it. And he forgives us and releases us back into his presence. It isn't this long process of, of mulling it over. It's this process of, okay, get back in. Our shoes can also represent self-effort. There are some self-made people in the room. Praise God, you've done well. And there's, this is in no way um, to disrespect hard choices and, and, and going for it. But, but don't fool yourself. God was with you every way and every, everything that you have. The Bible says if there's anything good in your life, it's because of him. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights. And so sometimes our shoes could be like, hey, I worked hard for these shoes. I'm not taking these shoes off. But self-effort, I think God wants us to remove those bits of self-effort. Verse 6, it says, then he said, I, and, 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 and here is where I, I, I think it's more than just take your shoes off because you're going to get vaporized. It's, I'm somebody, Moses, and I want to introduce myself to you. Are you still with me? Because I want to go on for like 10 more minutes. Okay. He says, um, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So God gives his title. His title is, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm your dad's God. Why would God need to do that? Because there were a whole lot of other gods. There were a bazillion gods in Egypt that Moses was familiar with. There were gods of Midian. And, and later as we begin to look at the, the language of how God is even translated, um, God is translated as the supreme God, but that means that there were a lot of other gods. And so he was saying, I'm this God. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God who made a covenant. I'm faithful. But then it says something interesting. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Um, if you know anything about Moses' life, and I'll give you a, a fast forward. If you were to jump into Exodus chapter 34, you're going to find the very opposite thing that Moses wants to do. So, and we're not talking about a long period later. We're talking maybe three, four months later. Moses stands before God on the same mountain and goes, hey, and God's like, I'm pleased with you. And Moses is like, sweet. And God says, ask me for something. He says, basically, I want your presence. I want to see you. And God says, you, you can't see my face. But Moses asked for it. I want, what happened between God God saying, and Moses being afraid to look at God, and Moses asking to see God. Are you tracking with me? What happened between, and we're talking three, four months later, I'm afraid to look at you, and now I want to see you. And I want, I want to say this, I think that what happened is that Moses met God. Moses knew something about God, but don't, don't think that he was this great little Hebrew kid that, that you know, knew the Torah and everything. Uh, he wasn't. He, was an, he had Egyptian roots, and now he had Midian in him. These are two not Hebrew culture places. He's about to meet God and, and, and not know about him. Like, oh yeah, you're the God of my dad and my uncle and, and my grandpa. But to know him, and that changes everything. So God's title is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Exodus, oh, let me jump on. Do you know, okay, let me just say this, that in that time, I'm talking about the difference between this Moses who has his, his dirty shoes and is coming to God and God says, take them off and, and he, I'm afraid to look at God. His, the, the state of his life, he had named his son Gershom, right? His son's name was, I'm an alien and a stranger in a strange land. And, and then he has another son, Eleazar. His other son is named, um, God has helped me thus far. And so there's these two moments that something crazy had changed. Verse 7, if you read it with me, it says, The Lord said, I have indeed, so remember he says, I'm the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, indeed, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. 
I've heard them crying because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering, and I've come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptian, and I will bring them out into a good land, a spacious land, a land flowing with, with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. In verse 9 it says, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have gone the way of the Egyptians, and, and um, I have gone, excuse me, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said this, I will be with you. This is the sign that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, um, you will worship God on this mountain. The thing that you need to know about God before he introduces himself even more to Moses is that God is a person. God is a person, but God is not a human. So God is a person, but God is not a human. Have I lost you? God is a person. What is a person? A person has personality. A person thinks. A person has ideas. A person has emotion. Right? God has all of that. And you see it throughout scripture. God is not a human. God created humans. And so, when we see this about God, it should be some comfort to us that one, God saw what was going on with his people in Egypt. He's the God who sees, right? He sees the oppression. He sees the difficulty. He sees the injustices in your life or in the lives of those that are around you. He hears. He hears the prayers. He hears the cries. It's almost like with God that it's like prayer, 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 cry, cry, cry. And there comes a moment when God's like, enough is enough. I'm intervening. He sees. He hears. I love this one. He's concerned. Right? Sometimes we've reduced God to a lot of cliches. But, but to say that God cares is almost, it, it, it's almost like not enough. He's concerned. He was concerned about his people. He's concerned about your life. He's concerned about injustice. Some people say, how could God even let that happen? It's like God letting anything happen. It's evil taking over in the world and God in his goodness coming into situations and bringing justice where injustice has reigned. Not only is he seeing, not only is he hearing, not only is he concerned, but he takes action. He's now going to take action, but he's not going to come down with a lightning bolt and zap Pharaoh and then kick the gates open and send the people out. But he's going to take action, kingdom action, through a person. And that person is going to be Moses and his brother and the whole posse of elders that you read about of the people of Israel. God works among people to fulfill and accomplish his will. But that's not even the good part. The good part is this. Moses continues on and you know he, he enters into a dialogue with God. And God has now given his title. But what I want to say to you is this. That if you only know God by title, you know God's authority, but you don't know him intimately. So in other words, if you know it's like God, right? You should stand in awe and respect of God. Absolutely, 100%. But if all you know is title, you don't know intimacy. Let me give you an example. I said it before. If you have a doctor, you call him doctor. You have a police officer, you call him officer, right? If you have a, a pastor, you might call him pastor. Those are, those are terms of respect, but those are also titles that, that come with a certain amount of authority. But there's something totally different to knowing that person by title and by name. Uh, Barry Case is here. He's walked out so I can tell a story about him. Uh, what, when I was, um, when I was like 19, you know, I lived near Huntington Beach and Barry is a sergeant in Huntington Beach Police Department. Sergeant Case, that is his title, right? And with that title comes a lot of, of, of strength and authority and reputation, right? And so I was driving down Golden West and I saw Sergeant Case there with another officer. There had been some kind, I was like 19, like I said, hair farming, 19 year old, my white little Toyota truck. And, and I saw him there with somebody. I'm like, oh, sweet. For me, I didn't say, oh, I want to go say hi to Sergeant Case. I said, I want to go say hi to Barry. <laughs> so me, I just drive up in the middle of it, and, and I go, and there's another officer there. I don't know his name. He's Officer Smith, I guess. And, and he goes like this, right? The total cop thing. And, and he says, get out of here. Oh. <laughs> what are you doing? You know, basically, there's a situation here. And you know what the coolest moment of that whole story is? Sergeant Case was over there. And me, I said, I know Barry. And, and then right then, Barry looks up and goes, Hey, buddy! Walks over, leans into my car, starts talking to me, just like I felt like a million bucks. 
Now don't just take away a story about Barry, okay? Take away the analogy. If all I knew was a person by title and authority, like all the, all, like the, the first officer who was doing his job and telling me to kick rocks, that was his job, right? I didn't know him. I couldn't say, hey, Bill, it's me, Danny, right? But I knew his boss. And I knew him by name. And when I knew him by name, man, I was brought in to relationship. It could have just been like, Danny, Danny. I could have got a double Danny. It would have been awesome. <laughs> so, so listen, if all you know is God, like take off my sandals, God, that is true of God. But, but what changes the game for Moses is this next scripture. And then I'm going to end, I promise. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me. It's basically like, what if I go to, the, to Pharaoh and give him your title? Yeah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's God has sent me. And they say this, What is his name? I know his authority, but who is he? I don't even know his name. Ancient world, name is everything, man. Name is your whole autobiography. Name is who you are. And he says, God said, tell Moses, I am who I am. That is not a pun. That is not some silly statement that God is saying for us to like sit and, and figure out, well, what does that mean? It's a very clear statement that God says, I am, I will always be exactly who I am. You're never going to be surprised and I'm going to become something else. I am 100% who I am and my name is this. See, that's the title. That's the translation of the name. But we don't even know how to say it. But, but it comes out like Yahweh, right? Yahweh. So God is my title. Lord is my title. Lord meaning um, master and, and, and term of respect. But my name, my name is Yahweh. And that changed everything because now Moses not only had title, but now Moses had name. And that took him from, I don't even want to come near, I'm afraid to look at you, to like, sweet, can I just see your glory? It took him from, I don't want to see your face, to like, show me your face. Man, this changed my life, and I hope it changes yours, because the way that you relate with God, if you're only relating with God by authority, and don't underestimate his authority, he is the ultimate authority. But that ultimate authority has a name, and he's given you the privilege of calling him by name, Yahweh. You see, for me, like, I, I can trust authority, right? I can trust authority to a certain amount. But if you give me authority and name, I trust you because I know you. Can you trust Yahweh? Can you trust the God who has a name? The God who will never fail you? The God who, who, who was and is and is to come? The God is, who is I am who I am. Um, yeah. I want to pray over you, and I, and I want to pray this, that there's a lot of things that I shared, and, and I'm going to circle back around for a while on this, because there's even more that I didn't get to today, because I think it's, it's fundamental for us, because as A.W. Tozer said, whatever we think about God, whatever we think about Him, that's where our soul is going to go in that direction. Um, the title that, that we have of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's a powerful title of a covenant-keeping God. The name Yahweh, I'm always going to be who I am, but that is my name. I can know a name. But Jesus helped us understand even another title of God. You know what that one is? Father, right? Father. Father means a lot of things to a lot of people, some negative, some positive. But what we know inherently about a father is he'll do anything for a son. And it's, it's an opportunity for us to come boldly to know him as dad. And so I want to pray over you today. Would you stand with me? God, as we come to you and we think about probably a lot of things in our lives, especially in a time of reflection into a new year and wanting to be better and do better and not let time pass so quickly without purpose and so forth, God, I pray that we would come to you, Yahweh, to the God who has always been and will always be and will never be anything but himself that we would come to you and that, God, we would know you by name, not just know about you, but through Jesus, and through the sacrifice that he made, that we could call you not only Yahweh, but we could also call you Dad. God, I ask that 
whatever it is that we've put up as walls, even within our religious walls, that have kept us from taking our shoes off in your presence, from being vulnerable and, and being in that place where we're willing to leave our past, to leave our mess, to leave our kind of our self-starter, our, our I did it my way mentality, got to leave all of that and to submit ourselves to you, to the God of the universe, and let you write the story of our life. Let you use us to fulfill your will and purpose. God, that's what we want. And so God, I pray blessing over each one. I pray freedom in their lives. I pray closeness with you, the God of the universe. Not the great spirit, not some idea that's out there, but a God who's real, who has a name, and who wants to know us just like he knew Moses. So bless each one, I pray today, and I thank you for them in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Yes, Lord.